Do I need a club? No. I always like your club, so sorry. Oh, Bentley Maddox joined. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Cynthia Johnson just joined. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Miranda. Hi, everybody. My daughter just said, hi, Linda. Do you want a clip for your hair? So I guess that means I need a clip that I don't have in. So that'd be, hi, Kay Brown, 127. I love coming on here and welcoming um, all of you, seeing where you're joining from. Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Yes. Hi, Sam Simpson. Hi, Lynn Missit. Sometimes I don't pronounce the names perfectly, so I apologize. Hello from Florida, Sam. Um, Rustic Pie 8. Hi. Hi, Kristen Mikoff. Said you loved the Korean vegan yesterday. So did I. I thought she was so powerful and great. And she'll be up in the Sunday paper this Sunday. Everybody says my hair looks okay. I'm telling my daughter. She, she has a good eye, though. Gabby Mommy. Hello, Magnolia, New Jersey. See NS Largo, Florida. Joanne, Joanne. Hi, from Long Island. Um, Ranger Mama. Hello. Hi, from Toronto. I love the breath. Hi, Felice from Florida. Um, I love that we're all over the place, all over the world. Hello from Germany. That's right. Mama researcher, like the color of my hair. Got to do what you got to do. Hello from Northern California, Martha Levin. Hi. Hi from Columbia. Wow. Uh, hi from Houston. Hi from the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Seattle. Arizona. Love that. New York. Jenkintown, PA. Look at this. Uh, J.S. Phelps, Pittsburgh. Hillary, LA. Um, Sweden, Anna Hammer. Boston, yes, yes. How about those Red Sox? Wowee. Hello from Michigan. Love my Michigan. South Florida, love that too. Um, the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Hello from DC. I hope you all, India. Wow, India. Colombia too, Ola. Ola, Ola, Australia. My son's favorite place. Hi, Ian Palmer from Australia. Villanova, PA, home of the Villano Villanova School, which I loved. Jesuit School, the Dominican Republic. I want to go there. Um, Connecticut, I love it there. Toronto, again, Long Beach. I had many great uh, years hosting the Women's Conference when I was First Lady of California in Long Beach. Hello from Cape Cod. My heart's there, you know that. Um, Allison, love the spot with you and Oprah. Blessed to have that friend uh, and Hoda. Um, and friends really help us in these times, right? The, they, we all need our friends now more than ever. Hello from Ann Arbor. Had four great years visiting my son Christopher in Ann Arbor. I could just come on here without a guest and talk about Sacramento. Seven years living at the Hyatt in Sacramento. Um, Richmond, Virginia. Love it. Uh, thank you for the Sunday paper shout out. I could just keep going. But Philly, I started my news uh, career in Philadelphia. So there's so much, uh, I would love, to, at some point I'm gonna come on here, we're just gonna do this. And I'm gonna talk about each city that you mention or each state. Uh, I had the great fortune when I worked in political campaigns to visit almost every, I think every state in the nation. So that was really lucky. Um, I'm really glad today that I'm going to be able to welcome my colleague to Conversations Above the Noise. Carson Daly uh, is my colleague at the Today Show, and he has been speaking out about his own mental health struggles and mental health in general. And I thought in anticipation of World Mental Health Day on Sunday, it would be really helpful for all of us to talk, well, for me <laughs> to talk to him, uh, for all of us to hear from him about how to live with anxiety, how to help a loved one who's dealing with anxiety, um, all of our preconceived notions about anxiety, the truth of it, how to help someone you love who has it, and all of the above. And he is a really great guy. He's made such an impact in this space. I'm gonna see if he's there. Oh, there he is. He's there, so I'm gonna be a prompt. Uh, he's made such a difference in this space, so I'm super, happy that he's made time to join us to talk uh, about this. I, I let him in, but I don't know where he went. So, uh, Carson, you're, you got oh, me. You where are you? Hi. Hi. Oh, sorry. My, my first IG live. Oh, is it really? <laughs> yeah. How are you? 
I'm good. I'm so glad to be your first. That makes me feel so special. <laughs> you always remember your first. I Yeah, you do. So we got that in common now. <laughs> this is so great. I love you so much, Marie. I don't see you enough. You remind me so much of my, my mother. And anybody who knows me uh, knows I worshipped and adored my, my mother who passed a couple of years ago. But your spirit, your energy, your brilliance, um, just the light that you give off reminds me so much of her. And um, I'm always so pleased to just see you uh, at NBC or if we're two ships passing in the night. We have a lot of history in Santa Monica together. So it's just always great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Wow. That's my first. I've never had that kind of love coming at me. So thank you uh, so much, Carson. That really touched me. Um, I love you too. And we have the same pastor. We both came. We have the same church. And uh, I take that as such a great compliment about your mom, because you're kind of, I think the last post you put up was mm. about your mom's passing and, and dealing with the grief of her unexpected passing. You thought that the call you would get there would be about your dad. Yeah. And that it was actually about your mom. So I was going to start with anxiety, but let's talk about grief, because grief yeah. is also a big part of uh, our mental health challenges. How have you learned to deal with your own grief? I think it's my superhero. My sister and I talk about this. I think it's uh, I've one a natural sister and then a Brady bunch of other relatives. But my <laughs> sister and I have been in the trenches since day one. We lost our biological father uh, when I was five and Quinn was eight. Um, and then when my mom went on the heels of my stepfather, who I worshiped and adored, I always say God gave me great two wonderful fathers. Um, we thought my dad who had end stage can cancer, my stepfather uh, was on his last leg, but it was my mom who was taking care of him, who out of the blue, perfectly healthy, had a massive heart attack and died. And then my dad died uh, six weeks later. So during that time of grief, which was, I mean, it's, it's a pain like no other. I don't have to uh, pontificate on that. People know um, sudden loss is in its own category. Um, although I've sold myself a big bill of goods that... Um, um, that my mom made a deal with God um, because my sister has subsequently moved to New York and our families are together every single day. And I think my mom made a deal. If I go first to receive my husband in heaven, um, this is going to be shocking to the kids, but if it'll be the trigger point to get my kids together in perpetuity, it'll forever change the complexity of their relationship. I'll do that. And I feel like my mom made that deal with God. So oh, wow. that's, that's how I sort of have worked all the grief out in my mind was like, Oh, well, she, uh, she did a selfless act. That's oh, amazing. God, good on you, mom. And to some degree, every time my sister is at my house and our kids are together and the cousins, family is the most important thing to us. We sort of have a nod to mom that that's how we do it. So, you know, dealing with grief, dealing with anxiety, they can be intertwined in a weird way. They, they also cannot be because for me, there's so much physiology happening with my anxiety that sometimes in really tough times when you think you're going to be vulnerable to a lot of anxiety and depression, um, sometimes our brain works in a different way and um, yeah. maybe it's walls come up. Um, I'm actually had, had very little anxiety during the most um, difficult sort of grief moments of my life. But the other thing I'll add to that is um, faith is, is, is my number one basis line for my life. So I, yeah. everything in my life, whether it's my mental health journey or my, the loss of my parents or just my life in general, it's all seen through the lens of faith. Um, which is another um, apparatus or structure that works for me. It's different for everybody. Yeah, I so identify with you on that because I have found that it's been my faith in those moments when I lost my mom or my dad or my uncle that kind of carried me through and helped me create a narrative that worked for me. Um, yeah. I know, Carson, you didn't kind of st start out to be a mental health advocate. You didn't think that you would be in the place you are in today, where people come up to you and share their stories of anxiety, their mental health. Uh, and it came about because you actually shared your story on the Today Show one day. How has that shifted your own life by sharing your own struggles, panic attacks, and your own diagnosis? It's brought me great joy. I, um, I never in my wildest dreams thought that the career path of my life, it's really been forever altered this big sort of left turn my life has taken since of a year and a half ago or however long it's been now where I very um, haphazardly started talking about my own mental health situation live on the air. I, I didn't know it'd be a good or bad thing to do. It was just organic as we were covering the beautiful um, Kevin Love article that was written for the Players Tribune newsletter that Derek Jeter set up where he spoke in great detail 
about a panic yeah. attack that he had had during an NBA game. And I had had that like exact same panic attack and feeling every word I thought he had like read my diary or something. It was so I'd never heard of anybody else that was in the public eye that was maybe a professional athlete had ever gone through something that I'd gone through 20 years ago when I worked at MTV, when I was doing TRL, when everybody thought I was, you know, America's teenager having fun every single day. What they didn't know is that behind that lens, behind all of that, those stereotypes was a young man really struggling. And I just, I was suffering in silence and just never really knew it until I was officially diagnosed, which was a great day. So um, once I started having that discussion on the air on the Today Show, and I had no problem, you know, I don't really care what people think, you know, I, I don't, you know, if I could help people, that's all that really matters. So, but Maria, what happened was it was like the movie Fight Club, where like the next day, everywhere I went, and I've been on television every day since like 1997, like doing in some capacity, MTV or NBC, yeah. and more people, everybody just started talking to me about mental health in the, in the airports and in the, that was the thing. And they would talk to me and ask me stuff or, or say, hey, me too, or did you ever feel this way? Or am I going to be okay? Or, you know, so I what, really feel. What did that tell you, Carson? What did that make you feel like? What did it tell you? Well, it tells me the truth. It tells me there's proof of the stats that we know over 40 million Americans uh, over the age of 18 suffer from uh, a mental health uh, situation of some point or some sort of anxiety disorder. So it tells me that, unfortunately, like me, uh, many people are suffering in silence. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. You have to remember, like I grew up in the 80s and 90s with movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest where like if mental health meant you were crazy. It was really black yeah. and white. You know, you needed a lobotomy. Like there was not, we didn't speak of mental health with, with kindness. We didn't speak of it with normalcy. We didn't speak of it like we do our physical health. There was such and still is such a stigma. Um, yeah. It wasn't until I opted to go to cognitive behavioral therapy. I really wanted to learn about the model of anxiety so I could better understand and help uh, self-manage, you know, kind of the way God created me is how I frame it. I have, um, my endocrine system is like a Ferrari. You know, some days I run really hot and I have to learn how to kind of, you know, drive the car every day and, and, I, and I own it. And I, it's the way God made me. And there's beautiful sides to the way that I was hardwired with my anxiety. I have a hard time controlling my nervous system and my, my ability to worry. And I compound worry and my mind races. But at the same time, I love, I think, to a degree that is, um, that's really magnificent, the kind of love that you, you know, you think that you'll feel from God, you know, the way I love my children when I see them, the way I love a sunset, um, the way when I hear music, the way it moves me viscerally, I get, I physically get like the reverse of a panic attack. So I think it, choosing how you frame your own mental journey is a big part of accepting yourself, accepting others and understanding that the, the dialogue about it doesn't have to be the way it was when we were growing up. That is so true. You know, the kind of everybody's fear of being labeled crazy, right? Correct. That is this kind of like, I don't want to tell anybody I'm feeling like this because they will label me. They will ostracize me. They won't hire me. They won't love me. Right. They'll think I'm less than normal. Um, right. And it's, it's exacerbated in communities of color, which is of great concern, um, the, especially with African-American males. Um, a lot of the work that we've done trying to shine a light on areas uh, like Chicago, where they're doing some really great things to try and get people into therapy who don't normally have access to therapy. So um, it's been a crazy journey, but I, I really am thankful that NBC News has given me a couple little digital platforms to shine a light on these different stories and these people in these spaces doing great work to continue to educate myself and to be an open book for others who just have questions about, and it's a, st it's a sticky thing. There's a, there's a lot in the mental health space and it's really yeah. different for everybody. So I always try and preface everything I say with, well, this is kind of what works for me. So you've also partnered now with Project Healthy Mind and that's to kind of bring uh, access to tools and resources to people where they can't find help. I know so many people are saying, I can't find uh, a therapist. I can't afford a therapist. I don't know where to go to get help. What are you trying to do with partnering with them? And what is your hope out of that? They're just a great, you know what, Maria? It started with uh, a rapper named Logic, who I was a fan of, who had a song that was very popular, that moved the needle in popular culture and also was a big hit. And it happened to be the title of the song was the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, referred to as 1-800, but it was the actual number. And I was so moved by what happened in that. He performed it on the MTV Video Music Awards and, and people were really talking about it and it resonated with me. And I ended up interviewing Logic and 
just exchanging ideas and thoughts. And he was involved with this group, Project Healthy Minds, who was nice enough to reach out to me. I've since joined the board and they're just doing incredible work in the space. But for me, it was like, sure, I can do this all day long. And, you know, I've talked to Kevin Love or Michael Phelps or, or all these other people who, whose faces you would know who are doing so much in the mental health space to help other people yeah. say, hey, if it works for this guy, if this guy can be the highest, best, most declarated Olympian of all time and be dealing with these things, then so can I in my life. So if, if we can offer that, it's great. But I wanted more. I wanted like some skin in the game. I wanted to get into more of the potential, you know, sort of data. I wanted to get more into potential legislation. Um, and Project Healthy Minds was this, is this nonprofit, just sort of millennial, driven, really diverse group of health professionals. And they're really remarkable what they do. And we are creating this sort of free technology that's going to make it easier for people to navigate the services space of all things mental health, which is anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal ideation, trauma, grief, all of those things will have this piece of technology where you'll, you'll be able to go and it'll better help guide you to something as simple as a meditation app or actual services to speak to somebody. So can they go, so can people, because there's a lot of people on here dealing with panic attacks, dealing with uh, anxiety, can they go on projecthealthymind.org now and get resources and be directed yeah, they, to something coming? We're just rolling it out. I think like most of the technologies, there's, you know, different forms, beta and whatnot. But yeah, projecthealthyminds.com slash guide. Try that or just go to the projecthealthyminds.org site and you can probably nav through um, either way, it's a great organization just to to read up on um, and and get to know a little bit, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is break the stigma of mental health the way we talk about it. And, you know, I think the most startling fact that I've learned through PHM is, you know, the average person from when they have a symptom of something going wrong to when they actually go get help yeah. is 11 years. That's the average length before you start thinking like there was times where I thought like, I didn't know what a panic attack was, but I was like, why, why do I feel right now so scared that there like, there's an imminent threat in this room right here in this restaurant or wherever I am. Like there's a saber tooth tiger about to take my head off. Why is this physically moving me? Like this is a real threat. That's just, a, that's just until I learned the model of anxiety, I learned that I do feel that way. My body is reacting and it's fight or flight, but the threat actually isn't there. That was an important piece for me to learn. And so, um, you know, people shouldn't wait 11 years to go yeah. talk to somebody to help figure out what's going on because it's, what they're going through is perfectly fine. What do you think, Carson? I, I'm so fascinated because I've interviewed Kevin and I watched the interview you did with Kevin and I'm a big fan of Ted Lasso who this last season, this season right now, has a panic attack, is yeah. talking about having a panic attack. And do you think this is a kind of new moment for men in particular to be more open? I mean, uh, kind of, I'm older than you, uh, but I'm like taken aback by how many men are stepping up and saying, this is my story, this is my truth. I too have panic attacks, which I think is just awesome. But yeah. I think it's really a brave new moment for men in particular. Would you agree? I do agree with that. And I think it's important. I think we see uh, millennials and Gen Z reframing and reimagining the idea of masculinity. And I think it's important. Yeah. And I think that they're doing a great job because in doing so, you're breaking down a lot of these old stereotypes that you and I grew up with. I, you know, I love the story of like uh, Dak Prescott, the, the quarterback for America's big football team, right? I mean, football players, they're gladiators. They, they're perfect and they're idyllic and they're they're, they, they, they're unbreakable and they're all that stigma about them. And I've loved all these football players coming out lately to talk about it. Yeah. And Dak Prescott, who, who's, who had a tough situation with his family, with his brother taking his life and Dak spoke up on it. And it was so moving to me. And I, I, I look at that, that sign of, of masculinity of his openness and willing to communicate. If I was his coach, it would further confirm that he's the leader of a team having the courage to speak about that, he would be checking another box of why I'm so glad he's at the helm of my organization. I think there was a couple sports writers who were like, oh, that's showing weakness. He's letting the defense and the other oppositions know that he's going through a tough time and he's not going to be thinking about football. And I thought, what a, what a really old school sort of masculine thought to have, you know, the, yeah. I like that the younger people seem to be changing the idea of masculinity to when men um, come out and are open and honest and vulnerable and talking about these things. They're just, it's so important. And, um, and I just applaud it. I, Dak Prescott is like, I, 
feel like a 16 year old putting his poster back up on my wall <laughs> beyond football. That's the kind of man that, that I hope my son can be. That's so beautiful. Let me ask you, you're a parent of four kids. I'm a parent of four kids. And I ha have so many conversations with parents who say like, I can't recognize it in my child. And I know you've talked about that you felt you had anxiety and you worried all the time, even as a little kid. Yeah. And I'm sure that your parents didn't recognize it as such. What advice would you have for parents who may be dealing with a child uh, um, who's dealing with anxiety and they're not sure how to talk about it, they're not sure how to identify it? So again, I would preface this by saying I'm not a health professional, so I'd always be careful with my advice. But in my own experience, I know that for 20 years, I um, everything was reverse engineered for me. From when I had my first major panic attack uh, at MTV before a TRL episode, and I ended up going to the hospital, thought I was dying, my heart was racing. Um, do you remember the commercial in the 80s for Calgon bath soap? Yes. There, there was a lady. Oh my God. And like, you know, Maria, the kids are crying, the, the mailman's at the door, the dog's barking, everything is go happening at once. And she says, Calgon, take me away. And then she's in a bathtub with soap and it all goes away. When I had my first major panic attack, that was the commercial that came to my mind. It was like everything in my busy life had been, was culminating and building and building and building. And like my beaker of anxiety toppled over, which triggered this panic attack. And I had no idea what was happening. I thought I was dying. Cut to many people have had this story. I was perfectly physically healthy. And my doctor was like, you're perfectly healthy. I think your life needs to be uh, managed better. And then I went into therapy and learned that, oh, anxiety. When I grew up, my dad was like, anxiety, that's like, that's an adjective. Like, that's not a, that's not a thing, you know, like get some sleep, uh, work harder, you know, and I, and he just was wrong. You know, he just didn't know better. Um, so somebody here, somebody here said their first panic attack, their Zen teacher uh, recalled the exact same commercial that you just said. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it, somebody had said. What does a panic attack feel like? And that's, it's a terrible feeling. And I, it's an uncontrollable, imminent fear taking over your body. And I've done a ton of meditating and I meditate every day and breathing. And I can tell you a lot of that stuff you hear mental health people say, oh, just learn to breathe. And I've been like, I have panic attacks and like in the moment, no breathing, like nothing takes away. The, the fear is a blanket over your body and it's uncontrollable. I mean, I ran out in Santa Barbara, California. I had my kids at a park, little kids. And I had a major panic attack and I went running for the hills. I left my wife and my children. Now as a man, as a father, that's a really embarrassing thing to admit that like I couldn't have been strong enough in a moment to handle an emotion and still look after my family. But I so went Carson, running. Carson, how, does, how do you look, you know, like I'd be interested if you're a wife or you're a husband or partner and that happens to you, how do you support somebody who's having that kind of panic attack? How did your wife support you when you ran out and left them there? Well, at that point, Siri knew, I mean, she knew what, that I'd been you know, dealing with this and kind of navigating my own, you know, uh, just trying to deal with it, you know, day in and day out. I, I frequently don't have them. I, it's not an everyday occurrence. It never really has been. And yeah. it's been a while. I, 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 my, my issue now more is I have a hard time just controlling worry. I worry about everything. And I always have as a kid. Um, but panic attack, I think seeing people is the biggest thing, you know, recognizing it because it's so often dismissed and feeling empathy for somebody, even if you don't understand what's going on, just letting them know that it's going to be okay. I think, because I always had this underlying thought i think at that very you ripped it all away i'm just a scared little boy who lost his yeah. daddy when he was five years old and i'm basically asking the world am i going to be okay like am i like am i going to be okay i think in all of my my worrisome and my my moments and i don't care about success or any of that stuff it's so trivial you know it's like we're all we're all looking for that am i going to be okay and i you know i pray to god every night that, that god gives me that peace and that that answer that i'm going to be okay um, and I feel like I am. So I think if you can just talk to somebody who's going through it and help them and help them realize I'm I, cognitive therapy, I love because it just, it offered me a lot of, of information on how to, once you realize that panic attacks really don't last more than they feel like it's for 15 minutes, but it's really no more than 45 seconds a minute. It's gonna be different for people. Wow. Um, and you think that people you're talking, I've had panic attacks in front of like, while doing a live interview, you could watch me on the voice live on a Monday night. And if you notice my right hand sometimes will be in my pocket of my pants, 
and you think, and I'm up there like, hey, Blake, what'd you think of that performance? And you just see Carson Daly, the, the loser on TV, you've seen for 30 years, whatever, whatever. Oh, his life is perfect. What you don't realize in this moment, this face is what I do for a living and I'm doing my job, but this right hand is in my pocket, Maria, and I'm gripping my right thigh because I'm having a death-defying panic moment on live television. And my brain is split in two going, okay, we're having a panic attack. All the triggers are happening, but I know what it is. I know it's not real. I know nobody else can tell, but I got to keep doing my job. That's a pretty crazy place to get to. That is a, that is a um, fascinating experience. I read in one interview, you said one of the things you found to be successful is when you feel your anxiety or panic coming, you squeeze your hands and yeah. you kind of... And I think that that I have found, because I also have anxiety, right? And that you kind of have some sort of physical reaction that takes your mind off of your mind and onto your body. That is one of the best things I ever start, first started doing to help with my anxiety and panic. I saw a doctor named Dr. Mark Oakley in Beverly Hills, who is a longtime history at UCLA in their psychology department. He's, a, he's an OG really great guy in, co in the early, early days in the 80s of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I went and saw him, took, I've just reignited with him recently, uh, like, oh, like a student and, and to take some tune-up classes. And I've loved our conversations about all of this. But he gave me back in the day this muscle relaxation um, technique that essentially is that, and you can look it up and there's a million different ones on YouTube, but it's just the idea of resetting your brain as to what relaxation really feels like when you're wound up or anxious all day long. And it's essentially clenching your wrist, as, as your, let's say your arms in this case, as, as much as you can, you're making a muscle and you're thinking about the tension, you're thinking about these muscles and you're holding the tension, you're holding the tension. And then you just all of a sudden let it go. And then your brain focuses on your arms and you can feel the elasticity of your muscles. You feel this sort of relaxation. And when you do that through sections of your body, it brings your sort of baseline relaxation level down and down and down and it reintroduces you to a new baseline that you may not have felt for a long time if you do it enough you get to a point where i got on live tv and it happened on the today show i mean it happens every now and again all the time and you'll i'll clinch i'll rock um i i don't know why my my calf muscle i clinch a lot and it just it's a little bit of that setting of like okay that's okay and i let it go and i'm like ah there's that relaxation live in that moment marinate that that feels good that feels good and i'm okay yeah that is so, such good advice. It's just, I think that the fact that you're so open, Carson, with saying, look, at, you can see me on public television. And yeah. This is going on behind the scenes. Gives everybody, I think, a, a moment to go like, okay, I may be experiencing something too, not to judge, because we realize I have no idea what's going on in someone's life. I think I know, but I have absolutely no idea, which just confirms why we need to treat each other with compassion and kindness because we have no idea what's going on in that person's life as you just said looking at you on the voice and then you're having a panic attack yeah inside. yeah and, and it's not to, it's not to solicit empathy from anybody I, I i i'm blessed and and know it and i you know balance is a big part of my life um but well, you're I right. Was, I, I think having empathy is a good thing. I think we can all have empathy for one another, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I, but, you know, we live in such a, you know, Instagram and, and, and perception seems to be something that's so valued now in youth culture in particular. Yeah. This idea of value in a frame in an Instagram post from a peer. And then it's this compare, how does my life stack up? And I hope that, I hope that we can... That can be for entertainment, but I hope that that doesn't drive people to feel inadequate in any way, because you know certainly that would be a bad path to go to go down uh, to keep everything in perspective. That's why, you know, I love talking about it. And if anybody's was like, ah, oh, I thought that dude, you know, had like kind of the, I thought he was like perfect life and has all these those things that you see, whether it's on TV or whatever you think, those don't equate with you know real happiness or people's sort of. Uh, global health being great, you know. Um, you also said, I read in an interview, Carson, where you said, you know, when we talk about mental health, there's so many things thrown into one mixing bowl, right? Yeah. We talk about panic attacks. We talk about anxiety. We talk about OCD. We talk about depression. So for people who are listening, you know, all of these different um, issues, right, need different uh, ways of handling them. So it's always good to 
kind of seek out to try to understand your own body and your own journey and then seek out somebody who might be helpful to you in understanding that part of your journey. Because as you said, these don't all go together, right? Grief is its own thing no. sometimes. Anxiety is its own thing. A lot of people on here are talking about having panic attacks. And then other people are talking about, I have depression. Then other people are saying, oh, I have anxiety. Yeah. And then, you know, a conversation I have with my daughter oftentimes will say like, well, kind of almost, there are re people who have really serious anxiety disorders. And now yeah. everybody seems to say that they have anxiety. The whole yeah. world is right. anxious. And, and kind of, can you explain the difference when you hear that, that like everybody says they have anxiety? It does seem to be popular. And I think in a lot of ways that's good. But um, I don't know. I, I wish Dr. Alfie was here to, to break this down. My friend who's an esteemed, um, uh, this is her, she's a clinical trialist and brilliant woman. She would break this down um, medically perfectly. I will say I, I was diagnosed GAD and panic, and I felt good that, um, that Dr. Oakley in UCLA diagnosed me after a series of tests because it, it, it gave me something to hang my hat on because for so long I thought I was broken. And there's nothing, there's nothing more, um, there's nothing tougher to navigate than when you feel like you're losing control of your own thoughts and, and you think that's so dire. But the truth is it's not. Thoughts are just thoughts. Um, they change all the time. It's a fluid situation. You're not held accountable to any thoughts. There's few thoughts that no other humans haven't had. And I think to me, Maria, a lot of it, and maybe this is just the ultimate sort of Catholic guilt in me, like, justifying everything um or the same way people go to jail they they turn to god and, and some people will say oh well what else are you going to do sort of thing i do that i i i feel like god made me this way i wouldn't change it for the world you know in the animal kingdom as the hyenas are sleeping there's always you know anxiety lives in nature and it's the two anxious you know animals that don't sleep while the herd's sleeping that are up being nervous that hear the predator and alert them and then they all go and they're all saved i mean it's how you frame it. I, right. I like Jason Bourne. When I walk into an airplane, I have to sit on an aisle, um, but I know where exits are in restaurants. I remember faces. Like, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. It's like a superpower. And again, I'm the physical physiological side of it is. I love this conversation. It moves me viscerally. I love again, like my family, my children, the joys of life. The little things mean so much. Um, and I think that to me, that's that's the other side of this 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 human coin that God made me and on the, and sure, yes, there's, I can't control a lot of worry and there's a lot of sensitivity, but it's my endocrine system and it's a beautiful Ferrari. Well, it's so beautiful. I thank you so much, uh, Carson, to come on. This is going to go, we're going to put this up in the Sunday paper on world mental health day. And you've done so much. Oh, please. To, by jumping into this conversation, by sharing uh, your truth, which opens the door, not just to men, but I think that's a huge uh, demographic that hasn't had a lot of people speaking to them. I, as I said, you, Kevin Love and others, you talk about Dak Prescott, Michael Phelps. Yeah. That has yeah. made it permissible to talk about and still be, quote unquote, a strong man. Um, oh my gosh, I got to shout out Darren Waller, the tight end for the Las Vegas Raiders, arguably the best tight end in the NFL. I mean, he, he's had such a crazy journey himself and he, he does what I do, make, you know, every day, all day talking about this. And he's like my hero. And um, so, yes, I do very little, but I, I appreciate, you know, Naomi Osaka, like, yeah, that was, that was incredible. You know, yeah. like who cares about the Olympics? This, this woman is like the bravest human being alive, like putting her, her mental health before everything. It's um, your buddy, Oprah, Michael Phelps, Adele, I, I, Kevin Love. There's so many Gaga. There's so many bold faced names that are, that are starting to talk about mental health. And it just, I hope that that helps rip away the stigma for people who are just suffering in silence because I was one of you and I know that it gets better. And I know, and, and I know that help is out there because I've, I've gone through it myself. So I just, I hope that people can hold on to hope. They definitely will. And you're bringing hope through Project Healthy Mind. We've put it up here a couple of times. Oh, that, thank you people, very much. Yeah, people can access projecthealthymind.com.org, the guide. We'll put that up in the Sunday paper. And there are any other organizations that are out there that are trying to bring help to particularly low-income groups. And there's a big dearth of African-American therapists, and there are people working to try to uh, change that as well. But I think, as Carson said, you know, suffering in silence is not the goal. 
uh, it doesn't help anybody, especially the person who is suffering. So find somebody that you can talk to. Take an example here from Carson. I love, Carson, that you're stepping, as you said, you want more skin in this game. Yeah. Uh, and you will make a difference. You are making a difference. And I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on to talk about this because it helps. I mean, I, I wish you could read all these comments that are just flying through here. Uh, oh, that's wonderful. And about uh, this experience. And this is what changes people's lives, right? Is when they share what's going on in their life, which gives permission to the next person and the next yes. person. And yes. That's, uh, so that's why we're well, I'm here. I'm. I'm so honored to be a small chain in that link that's hopefully goes on forever. And I appreciate, you know, you and you you know, inviting me to talk about, especially the timeliness of World Mental Health Day this yeah. weekend. And so, I mean, you just never cease to amaze any of us. Um, and I love you. And thank you for, for letting me chat. And for everybody listening, just hang in there and, and just remember the cliches. It's okay to not be okay. You're not alone. We care about you. There is help. Trust me. Um, I love you. Um, just hang tight, you know, hang tough. It gets better. That's so beautiful, Carson. Thank you. Go back to your Thank family. you, Maria. So it's late there. We'll I kind of liked the peace and quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rough, physical. Go back yeah. to the mayhem. Poor little kid. I'll do. That's a lot. I'll do. Okay, Thank you, God Maria. Bless you. Thank God you, bless you. Thank you so God much. Bless. Thank you. Let's mention again Project Healthy Minds. So you can go there. Carson talked about it. We'll put it up in the Sunday paper. It's available to help you uh, right now. There's other projects like the Depression Project uh, that are out there. So many people speaking out. If you have a child uh, that's struggling, uh, seek out a mental health uh, professional. Uh, and first of all, and most important, don't think you're crazy. Your kid is crazy. Your partner is crazy. That's you know from years ago. We've made so much progress and we will continue to make progress by people speaking out and sharing their truths and showing that they can be successful or thriving parents or you know members of the community and still have um, challenges as we all do, as we all do. So Carson is a really great human being, um, such a great man of faith and I'm so proud of him and uh, for stepping into this space, shining a light uh, on this and uh, I just couldn't be prouder of him. I guess I am sounding like his mother. He's reminded him of his mother. Maybe I sound like his mother too. So anyway, I, and I love all of these comments that came in by the hundreds of thousands of people saying that they also had panic attacks. They're also dealing with anxiety, uh, sharing um, what they have learned to do. Tapping was a big suggestion that came through here. I tried to kind of read as I talk but uh, so many suggestions, so share them with your friends. I remember Carson saying that he didn't even know what he had, and then he talked to a friend who a friend said, wow, that's anxiety, and you can get help with that. So sharing a conversation with a friend, seeking help from somebody you trust and feel is safe is a really great first step. I see I'm dealing with panic and anxiety. Um, so there is help out there for you. Perhaps uh, if you are, you can check out um, uh, Project Healthy Mind and they can help you. Crystal, crystal bowls, I've done that. Sound baths, uh, mindful on here saying I offer mental health services. So um, there is help out there and you are okay and it's okay not to be okay as Carson said. And there is help um, that's affordable and uh, what is that, Christina? You said black uh, therapists in uh, Philadelphia. There was a great organization. We were working with women. I think it was called, um, they were dealing with African-American men uh, who they were offering free, what's it called? Black Men Heal is another really great organization. Black Men Heal, um, doing great work in the Philadelphia area and others. Um, so those are just a few off the top of my head, but um, there's dreamers saying, I'm grateful to know I'm not alone in my mental health journey and in my awareness. Somebody else said, I'm doing tapping now. Okay, well, I, I've, I've studied tapping uh, and I've found it to be helpful. So, um, and Black Girls Breathing, thank you so much. You're right, we've done a story on the Sunday paper on Black Girls Breathing 
Uh, we're going to do a kind of a roundup of some of these organizations this Sunday on World Mental Health Day uh, and what they're doing. Uh, so if you need any help, um, I hope you'll find some there in the Sunday paper. Thank you for welcoming myself and Carson into your homes and into your lives, into your worlds. I appreciate that. I don't take it for granted. And um, I really uh, am grateful. Somebody's asking what is tapping. You can look it up. It's a form of uh, therapy that helps people. Um, kind of goes like that. But you should look it up and get it from a professional, not from me. Anyway, God bless you all, and thank you so much. I'm trying to turn it.